Although many unexplained things have happened on Lake Superior, none are as puzzling as the disappearance of the SS Cyprus. This strange occurrence on October the 11th is still a topic of interest because of the shroud of mystery and intrigue surrounding it. It was a tragic evening when the ship's passengers and crew boarded, not knowing their voyage would be cut short by a force they couldn't have seen coming. So what happened? Who or what was responsible for the demise of Cyprus? Why is Lake Superior known as the Graveyard of Ships? What are some notable wrecks of Lake Superior? Stay with us until the end. The SS Cyprus was launched on August 17, 1907, after being constructed at Lorraine, Ohio. She had a steel hull and was about 420 feet in length. Her weight was estimated to be 15,000 tons. She was owned by the Lackawant to Steamship Company, a subsidiary of Pickens Mother and Company, and headquartered in Fairport, Ohio, northeast of Cleveland on Lake Erie. Cyprus was on her second trip, transporting iron ore from Superior, Wisconsin to Buffalo, New York when a heavy storm developed near Deer Park. According to modern reports, the storm was nothing that Cyprus couldn't handle. The sole survivor, second mate Charles G. Pitts, said that the ship had been sliding increasingly to port all afternoon due to the northwesterly seas. The sole survivor. At about 7.45 p.m., Cyprus unexpectedly slid into port, turning turtle and sinking in the darkness and crashing waves. The ship's wheelsman, watchman, the first mate, and Charles Pitts, the second mate, were the four men that made it onto the emergency life raft, initially situated behind the pilot house. Because of this, the guys managed to stay alive for another six hours. But breaking waves greeted them as they got closer to land in the cold, turbulent waters. When the raft flipped four or five times, everyone safely reboarded. Nearing the shoreline, the raft swung around once again, but this time just one of the shivering, weary men remained on the board. Charlie Pitts could not reboard the raft, but he had tied himself to it and hung on until he reached shallow water, at which point he walked half dead to the shore and passed out. If Pitts hadn't landed half a mile from the Deer Park life-saving station, he likely would have quickly perished from fatigue and cold. 22 men were not as lucky as Pitts, and their remains washed up on the beach during the following several days. During the course of many hours, Pitts regained consciousness and helped identify his shipmates. Except for two, all the missing people were located east of the Deer Park life-saving station, wearing life jackets with Cyprus on them. An article about Cyprus appeared in the winter 1999 edition of Shipwreck magazine. It was followed by an article by Pitts' great-niece, Captain Anne Sanborn, of the United States Maritime Service. Captain Sanborn is an associate professor at the United States Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point, New York, in addition to being a master mariner and a Navy attorney. She knows her findings and plans to visit the Shipwreck Museum shortly. She and Fred Stonehouse, author of Great Lakes, have done extensive research on Cyprus. Charlie Pitts resumed sailing immediately after the incident and avoided discussing his defeat. Captain Sanborn said he had a long history of maritime duty, but he failed to mention his time on Cyprus. The Demise of Cyprus Marinas at the time were suspicious of the new Mulholland sliding hatch coverings, but Captain Sanborn argues that the vessel may have been built with fundamental problems since development on the Cyprus was halted by violent labour unrest in Lorraine, Ohio. A possible lead might come from forensic research in which the Shipwreck Society participates. As is the case with many thrilling puzzles, the first steps towards unravelling them simply led to additional questions. The Shipwreck Society intends to send the ROV to the site this summer to continue exploring and documenting elements that may help answer issues brought up during the first two dives at this interesting and difficult wreck. To this day, no one knows what caused the ship to sink in the first place. On the same day that the steamer George Stevenson departed Pittsburgh, he steamed through Cyprus and saw the vessel's unique red trail as the water was mixed with iron ore particles in the cargo hold before being pushed out. It has been speculated that the leak may have originated from the ship's Mulholland sliding hatch cover given its age. This kind of hatch often leaks because of the steel on steel seal. Thus, special tarps had to be put in place. Hwick's involvement in the decision to erect these tarps was not immediately evident. Rediscovery Great Lakes Shipwreck History Society members used side scan sonar to look for sunken vessels in Lake Superior near Deer Park in early August 2007. They saw a big item on the lake floor. The best estimate is that the SSDM Clemson went down on December the 1st of that year with all people aboard. On August the 18th, 2007, a submersible ROV returned to the ship for a second look. Efforts to determine the ship's identity as the DM Clemson failed when the ship's name could not be located on the bow. The crew then deployed the remotely operated vehicle to the ship's stern when the unbelievable realisation that they had found Cyprus was confirmed. Before this discovery, the Shipwreck Society had assumed that Cyprus was located about 10 miles to the north of the current location. 
Cyprus was found on her port side in water that measured about 460 feet in depth. Surprisingly, given the dramatic nature of her foundering, her hull is still in one piece. Wall panels, doors, railings, pipes, and her shipment of iron ore are only some items dispersed over the bottom up to 270 feet from the crash. The writing on her stern, which includes her name and destination, is still readable. There are still many unanswered mysteries about the sinking of Cyprus, which is why the Shipwreck Society intends to return to the wreck in the future to do a thorough forensic study. Some mysteries surround the lake in which SS Cyprus drowned, known as Lake Superior. Lake Superior, the graveyard of ships. Lake Superior is the burial site of 350 ships, and many are yet to be found. This great lake played a crucial role in the distribution of goods across the country throughout the years of the Industrial Revolution. Stormy weather was a common hazard for ships transporting iron ore, timber, fish and grain across these seas. Lake Superior is where you'll find the majority of shipwrecks in Minnesota. The United States Lighthouse Service built lighthouses at strategic points all around the lake to help mariners navigate the dangerous waters. The catastrophic winter storm of November 1905, which caused the destruction of 29 ships and the loss of 78 lives, prompted the installation of Split Rock Lighthouse. Many notorious ships and boats got lost or drowned in this evil lake. Some notable wrecks of Lake Superior Mayflower, 1891 Being the first wooden scow schooner of her kind to go down in Minnesota's section of Lake Superior, the Mayflower was an important historical vessel. This ship, which had been constructed at Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, in 1887, sank on June 2, 1891, while sailing from Portage, Michigan, to Duluth with a cargo of sandstone blocks. She sank in rough waters only four miles from the harbour's entrance. The ship was a two-masted scow schooner, thus she might have gone without assistance, but the available historical documents suggest that she was pulled by another steam-powered vessel. There aren't very many scows known to sail the lower Great Lakes, but investigations have found that the Mayflower possessed structural traits that were more common to New Zealand scows. The discovery of the remains in 1991 and the fact that they have retained so much of their archaeological integrity has yielded a wealth of knowledge about the history of scow schooners on Lake Superior and other Great Lakes. Samuel P. Ely, 1896 This three-masted schooner barge with a single deck was built in 1869 at the J.P. Clark Shipyards in Detroit and it was immediately put to use in the iron ore business between Minnesota and Michigan. Due to a severe storm, the Ely was separated from its tug near Two Harbors, Minnesota on October 29, 1896. The wind carried the ship across the bay and into the stone barrier. Because of its prominent position and the length of the event, the loss of Ely was seen by a significant number of local residents. Two major sections of the hull were damaged, however the bulk of the ship was still in one piece. Thomas Wilson, 1902 Thomas Wilson was a freight carrying steamer built in 1892. It left Duluth Harbour in clear weather on June 7, 1902. Because of the calm seas, the ports were not yet ordered to be closed. On the other hand, the wooden steamer George Hadley, with a total weight of 2,073 tonnes, was also on its way. As a harbour tugboat told the Hadley to make a U-turn and go to Superior Harbour, Hadley's captains ordered a quick turn to port without checking his surroundings or making the proper whistle signals. The captain of the Wilson gave the order to turn to starboard immediately because he was worried about colliding with the Hadley if he went to the port. But it was too late now. The Hadley collided with the Wilson at the port and drew back. As the Wilson turned over to the port side, it restored itself before sinking by the bow. Nine of the 20 men crew were lost when the ship sank within three minutes. Duluth Harbour then implemented stricter regulations in the wake of this accident. To this day, the wreck of the Wilson remains the most well-known example of the early whaleback steamship, a unique form of Great Lakes bulk freighter built in the late 19th century to carry grain, iron ore, and timber. Robert Wallace, 1902 The wooden bulk carrier Robert Wallace sunk while transporting iron ore out of Superior, Wisconsin, 20 years after it was constructed. She was an extremely uncommon example of the vessel that connected Minnesota's iron range to eastern US industrial hubs. The bodies was located 235 feet below the surface of Lake Superior when it sank. Several items, including a brass bell still connected to its wooden rail and inscribed with the ship's name, were recovered by underwater archaeologists in remarkably good condition. The hull has broken apart at the top, but the two sides and the majority of the stern were still in one piece. Niagara, 1904 The Niagara, one of the first examples of a type of big outside tugboat created for use in the Great Lakes lumber industry, was constructed in Detroit in 1872. 
The ship sank off the coast of Knife Island on the evening of June 4, 1904. The Niagara was sailing from Duluth when she ran into rough waves, and her compass broke. After striking the island's beach, the ship started to break apart, but the 11 crew members and two passengers were saved in time. The debris may be roughly separated into four sections, the stern, the starboard side, and keel, a detached length of starboard rail, and the port side. Hesper, 1905. The Hesper, a bulk freighter steamship with a wooden hull, played a crucial role in transporting iron ore and grain across the Great Lakes. May 3, 1905 saw the ship buried in a late spring snowfall, a situation unfamiliar to Minnesotans. The steamer was thrown off course by the 60 mile per hour northeaster and landed on a rock that still defines the southwest boundary of Silver Bay Harbor. Luckily, Captain E. H. Heaton and his 15 man crew escaped in two lifeboats just before the ship sank. USS Essex 1931 The USS Essex was an armed Navy ship constructed by Donald McKay in East Boston, Massachusetts between 1874 and 1876. The clipper ships he built made McKay one of the most famous shipbuilders in American history. As this is the only known example of a Donald McKay ship, its wreckage holds historical significance. From 1876 to 1903, the Essex was a US Navy ship. From 1904 to 1927, it served as a training vessel with the Toledo Naval Militia before being transferred to the Minnesota Naval Reserve. The Essex's three years of service to Minnesotans ended on October 27, 1930, when she was struck off the Navy's roster. The Navy lost its oldest steam-powered warship with the sale of the Essex on December 23. On October 14, 1931, the ship was towed to a beach outside the entrance to Duluth Harbour, where it was destroyed. Benjamin Noble in 1909, this steel bulk freight steamer was constructed in Michigan. I should not wish to travel with you. You are overloaded, the customs inspector said to Captain Eisenhart on Benjamin Noble's last journey. Her hold was so crammed full of steel rails that she sank in a fierce storm near Knife Island on April 27, 1914, after travelling west through storms. She was discovered in 2004 at a depth of 365 feet, about 8 miles off Knife Island. After forcefully contacting the ground, the ship sank into the trench it dug. Much of the ship, including the cargo, lifeboats and bell, has been left untouched since. Lake Superior is notorious for its icy depths and sudden violent weather changes. Many lives and vessels have been lost on the lake, leading to its other common moniker, the Graveyard of the Great Lakes. Those who travel into its depths encounter mysteries and tragedies that have yet to be fully revealed. It is the site of a few of North America's most famous shipwrecks. These wrecks serve as a reminder of the incredible power of the lake, as well as a tribute to those who have set sail on her seas. They also allow today's divers to explore the depths of this enormous lake, which is a significant benefit. Exploring these shipwrecks is a one-of-a-kind and exhilarating experience that provides insight into our maritime history. These mishaps or accidents may also be studied to learn and prevent future problems or accidents.